Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from July 1987. I report from the recent Replay Expo. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, Jeff is back with more mods, and I end with a great type in. But first, it's the news. Computer Gamer magazine has folded after a very short run. Despite Argus Press trying to save it with the relaunch four months ago, things didn't go to plan for the multi-format magazine. Selling only 23,000 copies per month on average, they just could not compete with the likes of Crash, who were selling well over 90,000. Owners of the Prism VTX 5000 modem often had issues using the device, with troublesome connections and refusal to do what it was supposed to do. Now though, you can get rid of all your problems with a new ROM upgrade from Spectra Communications. The upgrade allows the modem to work with all models of the Spectrum, unlike the original, and also comes with built-in terminal software to allow you to access scrolling bulletin boards. The upgrade will cost £22.94. Maskin, surely you remember them, right? Remember that awful EastEnders game? Well, Maxon was responsible for that, along with several other television tie-ins, like Blockbusters and Treasure Hunt. However, having now remembered them, you might as well forget them, because they've just gone into liquidation. US Gold have announced they have won the license to produce the computer version of the popular arcade racer OutRun. Having already put out other arcade conversions, they are confident that they can do the game justice, even on the Spectrum. Activision have acquired the rights to Infocom's back catalogue of adventure games. Popular in the US, Infocom were responsible for some classic text adventures including Zork and Planetfall. With the rights now with Activision, it has been rumoured that discussions have taken place as to whether the Spectrum Plus 3 machine might be a lucrative platform to sell those lovely games. So far there has been no official announcement though, but the adventuring Spectrum world are keeping their fingers crossed. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. Coming into the chart this month are BMX Simulator from Codemasters, Enduro Racer from Activision, Paperboy from Elite, Head Over Heels from Ocean, and Super Soccer from Imagine. And that was the news and top selling games from July 1987. Yes, it's that time of year again when Replay Expo returns to Manchester. As usual, I headed straight to the arcade section. Lots of classic cabs here. From Space Invaders and Gorf. Daytona, Power Drift, Hunchback, Phoenix, and a whole lot more. You could usually get a game on them too, although some of the popular ones did have a few people waiting. Pinball machines were also there again, always popular these. Sadly, I didn't get enough time to visit every single one, though. And of course, there's the usual lines and lines of retro consoles. Ataris, Nintendos, Segas, Famicoms, and the desperately poor showing from the Spectrum. All of these were easy to get to play on, too, as there were a lot of them. And it was good to see them attracting the younger players, too. Of course, there was the other items on show that held no interest to me, the new consoles, cosplay, and the rows and rows of stalls selling things like fake weapons and badges and games. I did, however, pick up two very nice Personal Computer World magazines. I also met up with Jeff Neal, had a few drinks, chatted about retro, and had a nice demo of the ZX Uno, 
a small hardware spectrum compatible device that looked great. We then bumped into Jim Bagley, a really nice chap, and he had promised Jeff a look at the Spectrum Next dev kit. Sure enough, he was more than happy to set it up, and gave us the details about how everything was going. Things are looking promising, and we should get to hear something before the end of the year. Jim is writing the Sprite Handler, amongst other things, and coupled with SD storage, HDMI output, and a compatible expansion port, it's mightily impressive. Even though it was only version 1.2, it was pretty cool, and Jim had managed to get it streaming a Star Wars film in real time from the SD card. I can't wait to get my hands on the complete item. Another great day out. Thumping 80s music, arcade cabs on free play, retro consoles, and a great atmosphere. And I'll be back next year, and I may even look at attending the Blackpool event too, if time allows. Only one minor complaint, apart from the expensive food of course, and that's more speckies please. This is Marauder, released by Houston Consultants in 1988. An evil civilization from eons ago stole valuable jewels from their defeated enemies and hoarded them on the planet Murgatron. As time passed, they faded away, leaving only old defense systems to protect their stash. You play Captain C.T. Cobra on a mission to reclaim these jewels in your Marauder battle car. The game starts with some great music, before we get into the shooting action. Yes, it's a shoot 'em up or rather a general shooter, because you can fire in other directions. The screen scrolls vertically, but you cannot move back down again, so it's forwards all the way. The first thing I did was to shoot the glowing blobs. However, you have to be very careful when you do this, because depending on the colour, when they are destroyed, they will give or take away various things, such as smart bombs, lives and shields. They can also reverse your controls and jam your gun, which is a real pain, and unless you're a good pilot, will usually end in your death. As you progress there are flying alien craft that shoot at you, and ground-based cannons that fire either direct shots or homing missiles. From the very start this game is hard. You can take two approaches. You can fly slowly and take out the enemies as they approach, being careful not to move too quickly into other areas with cannons, or go in all guns blazing, moving as fast as you can. I tried both methods and completely failed to make much progress. The enemies do appear in the same places though, so once you've played it a few times, you know what to expect. But even then, one misfired shot can jam your guns or take a life away. I tried for ages to make progress, and each time I got killed after only a few minutes into the game, usually less, and at times it was bordering on frustration. The graphics, as you can see, are well drawn and move smoothly, but the main sprite does not look like a battle car to me. The backgrounds too were detailed, with some nice parallax effects. Colour is used well, although the main playing area is monochrome, to avoid colour clash. Sound is limited to firing explosions and pickups, which works quite well. Or you can play without effects and just have the music. Despite playing for about 30 minutes, I never completed the first level, so to see the others I have to watch the RZX playback. The second level is a desert planet and there are different aliens and land-based cannons to destroy, and the gameplay continues to be challenging. The action fluctuates from careful manoeuvring to all-out blasting, and knowledge of the game map is essential. Control is tight, and there's no lag in movement or firing, which is just as well really.
I think an easier first level would have been ideal, introducing the player to the different elements of the game gradually, rather than throwing everything at them at the start. A good shooter then, but one for experts only. This is Brian Clough's Football Fortunes, released by CDS Software in 1987. It's a strange game because it's not just another football management game, it's a board game as well. Inside the box, you get a detailed set of instructions, a large cardboard playing area that you have to unfold, set out like a football pitch, a huge wad of cash, some playing counters, the game tape, and a large collection of player cards. Just by flicking through the player cards, you can tell which era the game comes from. To start the game, each player, and there can be up to four, is allocated £200,000. You then start the game, and you can change the team names if you want, and assign yourself to that team. The computer then tells you what cards to pick from the pack, Based on the numbers shown on them, these numbers indicate the player points. When added together, they will give you your attack and defence score. My team had a defence score of 15, and an attack score of 19. I also had two utility players that I could swap out to improve these scores, so I swapped out a defensive player to increase my defensive score to 16. The pack is then shuffled and placed on the board. Once you have your starting team and your cash, it's time to play. The computer rolls the dice, and you move your counter, just like any other board game really, and very similar to Monopoly. Landing on the various squares will prompt you to ask the computer what to do. For example, Manager's Luck will prompt you to select this, and it will randomly provide good or bad luck. Hurrah! I get 20 grand! Now the turn of the other player, and there have to be two human players, so I had to pretend to have a friend, and they go through the same routine. Oh dear, they've landed on selection problems, and again the computer will randomly select something. With the first round complete, it's time for your team to play their first game. To do this, you enter the attack and defensive values based on the player cards, and wait for the results to come in. One nil against the Gunners. Each result will have an amount of cash associated with it, and you get half of that. It's then back to the board, and the process is repeated over and over again. Board move, play a game, board move, play a game. Sometimes you get cash, sometimes you don't. Another win for Stockport, and another 25 grand. If your team is doing well, you may get entered into a cup match, and here you just sit back and count your cash while the results roll in. A lot of the early game I spent looking up the meanings of the places on the board, but once you get to know them this becomes less of an issue. On and on it goes, another win for Stockport, and another 25 grand. Things don't always go this well though, I must be on a lucky streak. Oh dear, my pretend friend has landed on a crisis. If you get this, you have to pay out 50 grand as a fine, and lose your best player. Oh dear, that's a bit of bad luck. More board work, and a game. Oh, and a shock defeat. You still get half the cash though but you are less likely to be at the top of the league and therefore play the better clubs and therefore earn more money. If you land on the auction square, the top card of the pack is turned over to reveal a player, and now you and your friends can bid to try and buy that player, and this is a good chance to replace some of your rubbish players. And then it's back to the same old routine, until the season ends or you're sacked, or you fall asleep. I'm not a big fan of football games, but I do like the odd management game, and this is a merging of the two, but I guess it would be better if it was played after a few beers with people who actually like the game.
For me, it was interesting to see the idea working and how the spectrum was used to assist the playing. But it wasn't a game that I felt I could go back to. This is Pentacon Quest, released in 2015 by Jarlax. Your quest is to find five golden acorns, and once collected, use them to enter the ancestral doorway. Along the way you'll have to collect and use a variety of different objects, and also use special pads that can be used to change the scenery and give you access to other areas. The game uses the Chirira game engine, so anyone familiar with the mechanics of the games produced using that will be at home with the controls and jumping mechanism. Moving around is hampered by the other evil creatures that inhabit the world, but they follow a set path, so you just have to time your jumps. As you progress you will find exits blocked and platforms unreachable, and so the pads are used to make these possible. The pads, which are magenta blocks, can be triggered by standing on them, or sometimes you have to manually trigger them using the action key. This adds a puzzle element to the game, which means it's not just a simple platformer. You'll need to use your brain as well. The puzzles are mostly logical. For example, you find a 16K Spectrum that needs more memory, and somewhere on the game map you'll find 48K RAM. There is one puzzle that involves growing a plant to reach higher levels that you don't know is there. Or at least I didn't until I watched the RZX playback. The graphics are great, with colourful and well-drawn backgrounds and nicely animated sprites. The music plays throughout and really adds to the game, and the controls are typical for a Chirira game, easy to use once you conquer the jumping. A great game then, a nice challenge and well worth having a go at. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Jet Set Willy 1-1 that was released by Nick Aldridge in 2000. This is one of four games released by Nick. Jet Set Willy 1.1 was the first one, then Jet Set Willy Stupid, Jet Set Willy Dupe More End to Panther, Jet Set Willy The Sun Is No Longer Producing Heat. Now out of all of those, I like the name of The Sun Is No Longer Producing Heat the best. However, this is my favourite of the quartet. Now at first glance, you might think, why did I choose this game? There's not really a lot to it. When you look at the map, the map's quite similar to the original Jet Set Willy. When you look at the rooms, there's not a lot changed. In fact, the first thing that strikes you when you start playing this game is the first room, which is just now called the toilet, there's hardly anything in it. None of the sprites have changed. The room wallpaper has changed, so the 8x8 square that's used to build up the walls of the room has changed, but the room looks very, very barren and there's not a lot there. Then when you move into the next room, the top landing, that's actually quite reminiscent of the original top landing. It's changed a bit, okay, but not a lot. Then when you move into the third room, the bottom landing, what happened for me was I started playing this and thought, well, look here, this does look a bit different. And I started trying to get through the room, and I thought to myself, hold on, how do I do that? And that's why I chose this game. I found myself saying a lot, how do I do that? And trying to work out the little puzzles that were in this game. I think anyone who's ever listened to any of my content on YouTube, be it in the Spectrum Show or my, or my own channel, you'll know that I like a puzzler. And what Nick's done in this game is kind of changed Jet Set Willy into a series of puzzles, and they're quite reminiscent of some of the puzzles that were in the original Jet Set Willy. A few times when playing the original Jet Set Willy, you'd think to yourself, how do I do that? And through a bit of trial and error, a bit of puzzling out, you do it. Now, 
what this game has done is ramped up those puzzles quite high. The first time this struck me was in the bottom landing, and it was just, hold on, how do I even get through this room? How do I get from A to B in this room? Took a little bit of working out. Now, the nice thing about this is, none of it's too difficult. There are some difficult moments in the game, but not too many, so it's not got that too high difficulty curve, which I've said before I don't like. But it does have all these really interesting kind of brain teaser puzzles that you can just work through one after the other. And one of the other reasons that I really like this room is that he's put in a room that's called Zero OK, Zero Call on One. And haven't we all seen that before in our spectrums? The backstory to this game is that after Jet Set Willy won, the builders have started work on Willy's new mansion, and it's not complete yet. However, Willy's still having his party, so he's had another party, and yet again Maria wants you to clean up. The interesting thing is that in Jet Set Willy's Stupid, Nick asks the question, why wouldn't she just sack Maria? Because Jet Set Willy's Stupid, hence the name of the game. Now as you move around this game, you'll be greeted by lots of semi-familiar looking rooms, but there are some new ones. One of the ones I really like, probably because you get loads and loads of objects in it, is Leafy Lane. I also really like that if you climb to the top of the mega tree now, you get a tree house, which was just a really, really nice touch. I like the tree house. And while I say that not a lot has changed in this room, some of the rooms are well worth seeking out. The cold store is quite cool. As with other games that I've reviewed in this series, you can't actually walk on the sea from the yacht and actually get into a room called Sea. So this is a little bit new, mostly original, Jet Set Willy, but with some clever ideas and some really clever puzzles. The main reason I picked this is once you start playing this game, you just keep going. You think, oh, what's next? What's what's the next room going to give to me? What new challenges are going to be? Or how is it going to look? And there isn't a great deal more to say about it than that. It's well worth seeking out. I think all Nick's games are worth seeking out. So if you haven't, give Jet Set Willy 1.1 a try. Until next time, happy gaming. This is Star Clash, released by Micromega in 1983. This early shoot 'em up was written by Derek Brewster, a well known programmer who later went on to write the code name Matt Games as well as Ken Tiller and Curse of Sherwood. This is a version of the arcade game Astro Fighter, a simple yet tricky little shooter from 1980. Waves of aliens move down the screen, and to progress to the next level, you have to destroy them all before they reach the bottom. If you fail to clear them all, they reform and you have to fight the entire formation again. If you are successful, the next wave begins with different aliens and different movement patterns. As the aliens get lower and less, they begin to move faster, making things even more difficult. The different aliens are shown at the top of the screen with the current wave flashing. The aliens fire at you too, and there's also meteors that move down the screen, although these can be shot. The attack waves move in the same way as the arcade, making them tricky to hit. The graphics are quite basic, but move smoothly, and the sound is very good for a 16K game. There's a constant warbling sound, along with firing and explosions. Control is good, but the game does slow down when there's a lot on screen. For a 16k shooter, this is a nice little pick up and play game. Easy to get into, easy to control, and quite addictive. I think it's about time we looked at a typing. This is not a new one never seen before, but one of the better ones to make an appearance in the magazines, and there were some pretty good ones out there. Impulse comes from Your Computer in October 1985, and was written by Chris Handley. The listing was only two pages, but did include machine code parts. 
The game itself sees you controlling Max Headroom. Ah, those old 80s memories. And his job is to keep the internal workings of a computer operating. To do this, he has to collect impulses, those blocks that are flying around the circuit. These have to hit him directly on the head, so you have to be precise. Once you have enough of them, when your score hits 1000, one of the random computers on the screen will start to flash, and your score begins to count down. You have to guide Max to the computers to fix them before your score reaches zero, and once you've fixed one, another one will begin to flash. So it's action all the way. There are nasty bugs moving around to get in Max's way, and Max moves continually too, so you'll have to be quick with the controls. If you fix all of the computers, you move on to the next level, that has more bugs. For a typing game, this is really good. Large graphics, smooth movement and good sound. It puts to shame some of the early commercial games. The only thing that's a bit annoying is having to line up the impulses with pixel perfect accuracy, so you can collect them. But apart from that, a great little game that's well worth a play. You can grab this from the Type Fantastic website.